This is the day the Lord has made. Welcome to Trinity Church in Barrie, and um, I'm so pleased that you're joining us on this midweek service. I want to talk to you this morning about a line that Jesus offers in the gospel about the world hating us because the world hates him. Now that's a pretty strong word, and you know I have to stop and think about that for a few minutes. Why the world would hate Jesus and why sometimes we are hated for what we do as followers of Jesus, and I want to reflect on that today. So we begin with midday prayers. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm numbered 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. For the Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. For the Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. The Psalm Prayer. Be present, merciful God, and protect us in times of danger, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you and I live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fill, fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If the world hates you, Jesus said, if the world hates you, Summer of 1979, I had just finished working at Toronto General Hospital. I was a student chaplain, and I went up back home thinking I would get at least some three or four weeks off because I was due to go to work in Sault Ste. Marie as the curate at the cathedral there. Uh, I was signed up to go there and to be starting off on uh, sometime in mid-September. However, 
uh, the Bishop of Algoma called me and said there's a vacancy right now up in Wawa. Now if you don't know where Wawa is, it's on the Trans-Canada Highway as you go north heading across Lake Superior, north of Lake Superior. You'll come to Wawa and then White River and right around all the way to Thunder Bay. So he said both Wawa and White River need somebody to look after them for the next four weeks. And since you finished your work down there, I want you to go up and uh, look after those two points because they're going through a difficult transition and I hope you can be available. It's very difficult when you're waiting ordination and your first job in the church to say no to a bishop. So I said to him, I would hope to get some time off and he said, well, you'll get it later on. So I agreed. And I can remember going up to Wawa and White River feeling, wow, these are really isolated places. When you leave Sault Ste. Marie, there's nothing much till you get to Wawa. And as you enter Wawa, you'll find this big metal goose that's out on the highway heading north. And White River was the, uh, had a thermometer in it. It said it was the coldest place in Canada. It's also where uh, in troops in World War I found a bear cub that they named Winnie the Pooh because he was, the troop was coming from Winnipeg. At any rate, I decided that I would work there. Working there was interesting because I got to meet all kinds of really fascinating people. But one day I remember drive, walking down through the city, um, well, town, city, whatever Wawa was considered, the main street on it's called Broadway, and I walked along Broadway till I came out to the near the highway and saw the big goose. Well, suddenly a car came zooming around with some raucous teenagers who had been pretty obviously drinking. They were yelling and screaming, and when they saw me wearing a collar, they started yelling obscenities at me. And um, I thought that was really interesting because um, here I am dressed as a, yeah, if you will, junior priest and they're yelling and screaming at me all kinds of obscenities. And I thought, it's the first time I've had people sort of disrespect what I do as a follower of Jesus. I thought that would be it, but they turned around their car, came back and started yelling again. And as I walked back toward Wawa and the place I was staying, they, they kept coming by me back and forth along the road and yelling and screaming. And finally the car pulled over. Two of them got out. There was a third one that was a driver. He, did, he stayed in the car, and the other two got out, and they started yelling at me and coming toward me. Now, I thought I'm heading for some kind of confrontation, and it might be violent. Well, one of the things I learned uh, at the University of Toronto was how to do all kinds of athletic things. I'd never been a great athlete, but I did everything athletic when I was a student at the U of T. And here I was, 29 years old, sort of heading into a junior priest, and um, one thing I had learned at the U of T was how to do boxing. So I stopped and I set a stance as if I was ready to fight. And as soon as these two young drunkard teenagers saw that, um, they thought that, uh, I guess, you know, and how tall I was compared to them, that uh, discretion was the better part of valor and they ran away and got back in the car and drove off. And I never saw them again. It's an interesting thing to see that how you people can take a resentment toward, toward God and Jesus and his servants. And I know why, because people go through pain and suffering in their lives and they say, why me, God? Why, why is God doing this to me? And there's a big resentment that can build up toward what we feel is, is a loving God that says, where was the love of God when my father was dying? Where was the love of God when my child died? Where, where is all that? It's a resentment and anger that builds up and it builds up because we represent God on earth and we are here as somehow representatives and that anger can spill over into us. We are targeted sometimes by that anger. So the world can hate us. It can hate us just like it hated Jesus. I worked eight years as a prison chaplain in um, Algoma district. Um, I was the jail chaplain in Sault Ste. Marie for eight years. I knew most every criminal in Sault Ste. Marie. And so I found it interesting work because I had taken over from a Roman Catholic priest friend of mine that I'd actually had met up in Wawa. And uh, he had gone up there and left behind him the prison ministry and said, would you take it up for me? So I did, and I didn't get paid, you know, I just did voluntarily, and eventually I did get paid by the government of Ontario to do the work there. Chaplains in the provincial system are called together, usually every few years, to meet together and to meet with the Minister of Comsoc, Community and Social Services. Uh, we fell under that umbrella, uh, Correctional Services, 
And so I can remember going to a conference in Sparrow Lake, which is just north of Aurelia. I've been there many times. It was, um, at that point, I believe it was Stanton House. We were called to that conference to listen to the government's idea of what we did as chaplains. Now, chaplaincy is representing, in effect, God and grace of God in Jesus to people who are in need. We're also ecumenical. So if someone, for instance, is a Jehovah's Witness, we contact the Jehovah's Witnesses to make sure they know that they have a person in the jail, a Salvation Army, uh, Jewish people. I even had one person who said he was Wiccan and I had to contact uh, the Wiccan people. That's kind of, you know, good witches or whatever they are and to make sure that they got, you know, someone to come to see them. Interestingly enough, the minister addressed us when we gathered together hospital chaplains, uh, chaplains who work with uh, mentally disturbed people, and jail chaplains. He basically said to us, we don't really want you to change anything. We don't expect you are going to make things easy in a hospital. We don't expect you're going to help people who are mentally disturbed. And we certainly don't expect you to correct the bad behavior of people in jail which surprised me. I listened to that and I thought, this is kind of surprising. Then he said to us, what I do expect of you is that you will be like a fire hose on the people that you represent, the people you're ministering to. And it took me a minute to think of that. And I said, excuse me, what is a fire hose? He said, keep them quiet. Keep them happy. Don't let them cause problems. You're there to make sure that they don't cause problems. That really struck me, that we're being paid as chaplains just to keep things quiet, just to make sure people don't disturb you know, things the way they should be. And it bothered me. When I came back from that conference, I knew I couldn't probably stay in chaplaincy much longer. And within a year, actually, I was being moved to Bracebridge. But it bothered me the sense that we were tolerated by the government. We were tolerated as people who did something to keep things cool, to keep things from happening, to be that fire hose that somehow stops any kind of confrontation. And that said to me that we were not respected for who we were. We were tolerated in what we did. If the world hated me, Jesus said, the world will hate you. It will tolerate you maybe, but we are not expected to do anything great. There are prophetic voices um, that discourage those in power. Governments are those in power. They represent the powerful, the rich, the people who control everything. Uh, we know in American politics, if you're not a multimillionaire, you'll never get elected anyway because the money amount it takes to get elected is huge. And they have these super PACs that influence voters by funding them with millions of dollars. Well, we know also that when people stand up to those people in power, they can either be crushed or tolerated or not tolerated. Countries in South America, for instance, have all dealt with dictatorships and power brokers. One country in particular, El Salvador, has nine families that really own and run everything in the country. Nine families. And for decades, those nine families have run everything in El Salvador. When the church in El Salvador wanted to do things, it was again tolerated as long as it towed the line. It towed the line in favor of the rich and powerful nine families. Oscar Romero was a middle class uh, priest. He had been come up the ladder in the priesthood. And as a middle class priest, he was asked to uh, meet with these nine families time and again because if you wanted to move higher, you had to make friends with these families because they would influence the Vatican to move you up the ladder. Well, they did like him, and so Oscar Romero moved up the ladder, and he became a Monsignor, and then eventually an assisting bishop. And finally, because they were so enamored of him, and he paid them so much attention, these nine families, that the Vatican made him the Archbishop of El, of El Salvador. Um, San Salvador is a big city in El Salvador, and he was the Archbishop in charge of all of the priests, basically, in the country of El Salvador. But something happened to him. He went to visit these parishes and he found out that clergy were being persecuted if they stood up for the poor and the needy. In fact, the army and the civil servants who served in those communities kept the poor down, kept the poor poor, and kept them on a subsistence level in many places. And the more Oscar Romero saw of this, the more he was resolved that this was not 
the work of Jesus Christ, that somehow they had to be standing up for the poor and standing up for the needy and standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves. He did something that obviously ran afoul of the powers that be. Now, it's not that easy in a democracy for many of us to run afoul, although we can do that too. In Canada, we hide sometimes illegal immigrants and other things, but in particular, El Salvador, when Oscar Romero stood up and basically championed the priests who were fighting for the poor and the needy, he was basically disowned by the nine families that run the country. They approached the Vatican to have him removed. The Vatican would not remove him. And so one day as he celebrated mass in San Salvador at his cathedral, he was machine gunned down. He was killed, assassinated, if you will, by the powers that be because he stood for the poor and the needy against the powers that be. That's why the world can hate us because we are called to stand up for those who are in need, for the poor, the suffering, the broken. I have in my ministry tried to set up food banks and other things. I think the hardest time I had was in Kingston when we set up a thing called Martha's Table to feed people. And we met opposition from a lot of restaurants because they said, how can you do for a toonie, provide a three course meal because you'll cut into our business. And we had a lot of people protesting that we were actually feeding students and others for a toonie, giving them a decent meal and people on the street. My answer to them was many of these people on the street would not go to your restaurant. They're getting a good, nourishing, three-course meal, soup, main course, and dessert, through to us for two, two, two loonies, or, or a toonie. And they countered by saying, but, you know, if you take our business away, we won't help support anything in the church. Sometimes standing up for the poor needy is dangerous, and it's hard. But that's part of who we are if we are going to model the servanthood of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself had come to a point in his ministry where he had to basically take a stand. It's one thing to wander through Galilee and to wander through Judea, to heal people, to touch people, to be there with people and hear them, to lift up people who were downtrodden, to assail the concept of illness is a result of sin and say, no, it's not. It's also really hard to see Jesus befriends tax collectors who everybody hates and prostitutes he defends and says, you know, you without sin cast the first stone. He's really walking into the face of authority. He's walking into the face of what people have believed for a long time. That if you're sick, God's punishing you. If you're well, God's prospering you. That cause effect kind of thing which Jesus did not buy and said God doesn't work that way. He challenged all the preconceptions that society had, and perhaps the moment of truth comes when he goes to the temple in Jerusalem, and he picks up the tables and knocks them over, throws out the, the money changers, and basically says, this, my father's house, is a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. When God becomes part of the power structure, when God is used by the powers that be to justify their cheating, their taking, their corruption, then God is offended. And Jesus is willing to stand up to that. And so do we have to, as followers of Jesus Christ, stand up to what is wrong, what is wrong in society, and what is very wrong sometimes, the way the church stands. In Canada recently, we've seen the fact that the residential school issue is a tough issue to deal with. It, it, it reverberates through the past into the present. And when you see or hear about clergy who are saying, well, you know, it didn't really happen or whatever it might be, the nation is shocked and so should we all be because we have to recognize the fact that we are not perfect. And when we do come to recognize the failures of the past, we have to be there to say yes, and we regret that. And not only regret that, we want to atone for that. We want to say this was wrong. And what happened to the people who were native people, aboriginal, indigenous people in this country was a misconception and it was wrong. And we have to atone for that as people. We also have to stand up against the hard, you know, for the hard right against the easy wrong. It's easy to give in to power. It's easy to give in to wealth. It's easy to sort of say, well, it's just the way things are. And yet we as followers of Jesus have to be willing to overturn tables, to be willing to be hated, to be willing to be what Jesus calls us to be, 
the leaven of society, the leaven of people left, right, and center. And if that means that people will hate us sometimes, so be it. He was obviously hated. He wouldn't have gone to the cross if he weren't willing to sacrifice himself. But in going to the cross, he made a point that love is conquers all. Love only a wink it. Love conquers all. And there is nothing you can do to stop the power of love. And the power of love will not be corrupted. It will not be destroyed. And ultimately, love will overcome hate. And Jesus knew that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the triumph of love. And love trumps hate every single time. If we are hated, know that the world will hate us as it hated Jesus. But if the world also recognizes the resurrection of Jesus, it also knows deep down that love is the way. I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Comfort us in all our affliction. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Fill this world with the radiance of your glory that all nations may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and every day. Amen.